Christian flags can fly high in Boston. This after the Supreme Court came out with a unanimous ruling. We don't see that too often in America these days. Authored by the outgoing Stephen Breyer. We've got a new judge coming in and Breyer's on his way out. And he actually wrote this opinion joined by all of the other eight judges. The headline comes over from the Epoch Times tells us Boston's refusal to allow the Christian flag to fly unconstitutional and all of the justices agreed and this is fun because the city had previously said no christian flags not allowed that is just offensive to people but here they just said oh the chinese communist flag no problem roll it on up there you need help here let me come over and help you flag that thing right on top there you, you can put it above the american flag no big deal at all supreme court ruled unanimously on may 2nd that allowing national flags and flags about historic events, causes, and organizations to fly outside City Hall while refusing to raise the Christian flag is an unconstitutional example of government censorship. We'll take a look at the full opinion, but we can see the judges Brett Kavanaugh, Samuel Alito, and Neil Gorsuch each filed a separate opinion concurring in the judgment of the court. And so we'll take a look at the majority opinion, but there's also several other opinions that are called concurring opinions, which means these judges agree with the outcome, but they may have a different constitutional framework or a different rationale for why they think this is the right outcome. But they're all voting for the same outcome. Yeah, Boston, you guys are losers for doing this. Totally unconstitutional. But different reasons as to why. Here is the opinion over from the Supreme Court of the United States. We can see it's Shirtliff versus the city of Boston. Came up out of the First Circuit. And we get some background here. It tells us just outside the entrance out of Boston City Hall on City Plaza, there are three flagpoles. Big problems ahead. We can see it. Boston flies the American flag on the first pole, Massachusetts flag on the second pole, and usually flies the city's own flag from the third pole. We have American flag, state flag, city flag. But Boston has for years allowed groups to hold ceremonies on the plaza during which time that third flagpole, free game. You can put your flag up there, no problem. Between 2005, 2017, Boston approved the raising of 50 unique flags for 284 ceremonies. 50 groups come up, they hoist their flag up. Most of these flags were for other countries. Some were associated with groups or causes like the pride flag, a banner honoring emergency medical service workers and others. Then, uh-oh, we're in trouble. 2017, Har Harold Shirtliff, Director of an organization called Camp Constitution asked to hold the event on the plaza to celebrate contributions of the Christian community. Illegal! Says, as part of that ceremony, he wished to raise what he described as a Christian flag. The commissioner of the Boston Property Management Department uh, worried that flying a religious flag at City Hall would violate the Establishment Clause and found no instance of the city having raised such a flag. He therefore told Shirtliff that the group could hold an event on the plaza, but could not raise their flag during it. Shirtliff and Camp Constitution sued, claiming that Boston's refusal to let them raise their flag violated the free speech clause. District Court held that flying private groups' flags from the city halls amounted to government speech, so Boston could refuse the petitioner's request. So the first level court said, you know, by us allowing you to use our flagpole, we are kind of endorsing whatever you put on there. And so, you know, we do have the First Amendment, which says free speech, but we also have the First Amendment, which says no prohibitions against religion. We have freedom of religion right here. And so if we have the government endorsing one religion over another religion, well, then that means it's, it's sort of oppressing the other religions and true freedom of religion means we don't have the government oppressing anybody's religion by endorsing one religion over another and so now the courts are going man this is complicated so i guess what we have to do is tease out the two things that are happening this free speech versus the establishment clause make sure we're dissecting the two of them that's what the district court did so that's why they said oh well you know we can allow other free speech stuff, but just not the stuff that sort of crosses over and overlaps with religion. So Boston said they could refuse their request without running afoul of the First Amendment because they're saying the Establishment Clause is more important than the free speech. First Circuit, as this went up on appeal after Shirtliff lost, he said, no, we're going to take this up. First Circuit said, you're nobody, you lose. The Establishment Clause is more important. The court granted here, Supreme Court said, well, 
We're going to hear this case. We're going to decide, here's the issue, whether the flags Boston allows others to fly express government speech and whether Boston could, consistent with free speech, deny petitioners flag raising requests. That's the issue. Two, two parts, really. One, whether the flags Boston allows others to fly is government speech. And two, whether Boston could, consistent with free speech, deny the flag raising request. Held. Part one, Boston's flag raising program does not express government speech. And if it's not expressing government speech, if it's not government speaking, well, then maybe it's not going to fall over into the establishment clause. Let's see how the court reasons through this. They write, the free speech clause does not prevent the government from declining to express a view, citing an old case from the U.S. Supreme Court. The government must be able to decide what to say and what not to say when it states an opinion, speaks for the community, formulates policies, or implements programs. The boundary between government speech and private expression can blur when, as here, the government invites the people to participate in a program. That's what you get for letting them use your flagpole. Here it says, in those situations, the court conducts a holistic inquiry to determine whether the government intends to speak for itself or rather to regulate private expression. The court's cases have looked at several types of evidence to guide the analysis, like the history of the expression at issue, the public's perception as to who, whether the government or a private person is speaking. So the question here would be, what do people think when they see that flag up there? Do they think that that is the government endorsing the pride flag or the government endorsing the Christian flag? Or do they think, oh, it's just, you know, whatever community is out there for their rally, they just put their flag up there. And so it's obviously connected to what's going on there. All right, we got it. It's the Christians or it's the pride groups. It's those people out there who are connected with the flag. Got it, not a big deal. So we're not going to ascribe that to the government and we're not going to consider that to be government expressive or government speech. Here it says the extent to which the government has actively shaped or controlled the expression. Now we get into a precarious position because what if it is the government trying to sort of manipulate the conversation, which is kind of what's happening here, right? We see the government saying, no, that's okay. That's not okay. And you might say, well, they found a justification for this based on the establishment clause. They found a reason to preclude the Christians, or you could just say, well, they just were looking for a reason to preclude the Christians. You could say it was a legitimate foundational approach. It was a legal analysis that they did. And they said, well, we weighed the pros and cons of letting the Christians weigh their, put their flag up there. And we, it's just too close to call. So we legitimately just have an establishment cause issue. Or it could just be, well, the establishment clause will work. We can, we can get them out of there. Just tell them the establishment clause. They don't know any better. Here it says... Considering these indicia, so those different sort of balancing factors, the court held that the messages of permanent monuments in public park, those were government speech, permanent, even when the monuments were privately funded or donated. So if a Christian were to donate a flagpole with a Christian flag up there and this court said, and this city said, yeah, no, no problem. Perfect. That's fine. Or same thing with a pride flag or any of those issues, they would have said, no, that's too much. Right? It's a permanent thing that sort of amounts to government expression. In Walker, the court found that license plate designs proposed by private groups also amounted to government speech because, among other things, the state issued the plates and maintained direct control over the messages conveyed. On the other hand, there was another case. The court concluded that trademarking words or symbols generated by private registrants were not an exercise of government speech because it was an authorization administrative function. Applying similar analyses here, they say, let's go through this. The court finds that some of this evidence does favor Boston. Maybe they can actually use the establishment clause and keep it out, but other evidence favors shirtlift. Let's see. The history of flag flying, particularly at the seat of government, supports Boston. Flags evolved as a way to symbolize communities and governments, not just the content of the flag, but also its presence and position conveyed important messages about the government, right? It sort of is expressive. Governments have been using it all the time. They put flags up for a reason. It says, hey, this is Arizona. This is Boston. Similarly, flying a flag other than a government's own can also convey a governmental message. For example, another country's flag outside the Blair House across the street from the White House signals a foreign leader is visiting. Consistent with this history, flags on Boston City Hall Plaza usually convey the city messages. 
It's a tradition. It's a pattern. People know what it's there for. Boston's flag symbolizing the city. And when flying at half staff, it conveys a community message of sympathy or sober remembrance. Question remains, though, whether on the 20 or so times a year that Boston allowed a private flag up there, whether that also expressed the city's message. Because they used it to express messages by raising, lowering the flags. Are they also using it if somebody else puts their flagpole up? Flag up on the flagpole? We don't know. The circumstantial evidence of the public's perception does not resolve the issue. The most salient feature of this case is that Boston neither actively controlled these flag raisings nor shaped the messages the flag sent. To be sure, Boston maintained control over the event's date and time to avoid conflicts. It made control over the plaza's physical premises to avoid chaos. But the key issue is whether Boston shaped or controlled the flag's content and meaning. Such evidence would tend to show that they intended to convey the flag's messages as its own. And on that issue, the Boston record is thin. We don't know whether they were doing some sort of content moderation. If they were moderating the content, they were precluding certain messages from going up. Well, that maybe says that they're trying to say something. We're endorsing these, but not those. And on that issue, record is thin. Boston says that all or at least most of the 50 unique flags it approved reflect particular city endorsed values or causes. That may well be true of other nations' flags or the pride flag raised annually to commemorate Boston Pride Week, but the connection to other flag raising ceremonies like the one held by a community bank, it's more difficult to discern. What values are those? Further, Boston told the public that it sought to accommodate all applicants who wish to hold events at their public forums, but the city's application form only asked for contact information and a brief description with proposed dates. The city employee who handled the applications testified that he did not request to see flags before the events. Indeed, the city's practice was to approve flag raisings without exception. That is, until petitioner's request. Oh, very curious. At the time, Boston had no written policies or clear internal guidance about what flag groups could fly and what those flags would communicate. Boston's control is therefore not comparable to the de degree of government involvement in the selection park monuments or license plate designs. Boston's come one, come all practice, exempt that is for petitioner's flag, is much closer to the patent and trademark office, all told Boston's lack of meaningful involvement in the selection of their flags or crafting of their messages leads the court to classify the third party flag raisings as private, not government speech. And because it's not government speech, then it can't impact the establishment clause. It's not expressive. It's not the government taking a position one way or another that might infringe upon the establishment of religion from some other entity. Here it says, because the flag raising program did not express government speech, Boston's refusal to let petitioners fly their flag violated the free speech clause of the First Amendment. So we go out of the establishment clause and sort of back over into the free speech clause. It says, when the government does not speak for itself, it may not exclude private speech based on religious viewpoint. So if it's not going to be taking a position, it's got to be equal in its allowance of conversations to take place. If it precludes somebody, that discrimination based on religious viewpoint is unconstitutional. Doing so would otherwise constitute viewpoint discrimination. Wrapping up says Boston concedes that it denied petitioners request out of establishment clause concerns solely because of the promoting of a specific religion in light of the court's government speech holding. So here saying it's not an establishment clause issue. This is a free speech issue. So you were in the wrong part of the first amendment. It says here, Boston's refusal now to allow petitioner to raise their flag because of its religious viewpoint violated the free speech clause. And everybody else joined in on this. You've got Chief Justice Roberts signed off, Sotomayor, Kagan, Kavanaugh, Barrett joined. We've got Kavanaugh, concurring opinion, Gorsuch, and Thomas Alito all joining. Big victory for Harold Shirtliff and his legal team. Long battle all the way up to the Supreme Court. Got a unanimous ruling. And so the flag we see here should be flying back in Boston. We'll see if his team, his community over there at Camp Constitution, if they go out there and celebrate, rising it all the way up to the top. Very, very tall. 
letting it linger. Hopefully it's a nice windy day, beautiful gusts of wind. So it just flaps all over the mountains opening up an array of sunshine careening down from the heavens upon the camp constitution flag right over the city of Boston radiating. I hope you enjoyed this video, my friends. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.